right, I'm going to preach from here again today. I have, my medical diagnosis is I have a hitch in my get-along. So maybe, maybe the reason I still have it is because that's what my doctor says. So I should upgrade to my medical care. All right. Uh, I invite you to open your Bibles to the book of Philippians. There's several places that, uh, besides the Matthew 1 and Luke 2 passages, where we get great chunks of Christmas story. And Philippians 2 is one of my favorites for all kinds of reasons. And so I want to share with you just a few words about the Christmas story from uh, Paul's letter to the church at Philippi. Those of you who have been a part of December Sundays all month long, in fact, we started the last Sunday of November, we've been talking about Uh, The light, Jesus and the light he brings to a world that is so covered in darkness, trapped in darkness. And and that light shines hope and love and joy and peace and some wonderful gifts we would not receive were it not for the Christ who has come. The prophet Isaiah spoke about a Savior who would come. He said, Arise, shine, for your light has come The glory of the Lord has risen upon you. What a great uh, string of words to express something so powerful. John introduced Jesus at the beginning of his gospel account this way. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. And without him, not anything made that was made. In him was life. And that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness. And the darkness has not overcome it. He's the light. Jesus said, I am. One of those great say we, we talked, we went through the gospel of John chapter by chapter earlier this year. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Now on this Sunday before Christmas, as we consider the coming of Christ to the earth, uh, the circumstances surrounding the birth of Jesus, it's a great story, inspiring story, uh, fills us with gratitude. We see the gift of it. Uh, but sometimes for me, uh, the Christmas card manger scene uh, seems far away, out of reach for me. As I say, well, here's where I actually am in my life today. Here's how the world feels, and it doesn't feel uh, Christmas card happy. It doesn't feel Christmas card smooth, easy, and wonderful today. And what I'm grateful for on this Sunday before Christmas is that the Christmas story is bigger than make me feel warm and fuzzy uh, for a few moments in the season. We're going to look at a little deeper reflection of this. We're going to look uh, at the experiences, the attitudes, just briefly wrapped around Moses. Uh, Moses. Mo- turn to Exodus. Um, there's a lot of pressure today. That's why it's really hard today. There's a lot of pressure, partly because you're all in the wrong place, and, and partly because... I usually don't feel pressure because I have two services, so only one of them goes on the website. So I only have to do well one Sunday, uh, one one service a Sunday. Today, it's all on the line, so we'll edit all this out later. How many of you usually in the first service? I just use that as practice anyway, so you're you're used to this. That's just rehearsal. Okay, Um, we'll edit that out too. So with uh, Joseph, you think about Joseph, and at the beginning of that Gospel of Matthew, uh, man, things aren't going well for him. Life isn't working out the way he thought it would work out. He is betrothed, a little more serious than engaged, to this woman Mary, and she is found to be with child, and that's not how it's supposed to go. And he is freaked out, and he's going to try to do the right thing, but he figures this is all done. We are finished with this, and, and... Things that are special, celebration things in life. I think that uh, everything that's hard about life just gets magnified when it's supposed to be one of those special times. And Christmas does that to us, doesn't it? Don't you feel a little heavy things get heavier at Christmas time? Uh, Struggles become more struggling at Christmas time. And here's uh, here's what I see in that story of Joseph. When life doesn't turn out the way we thought it would. For some of you, you're saying, man, it's not working the way I thought it would. Not with, I thought it'd be healthier than this. 
I thought marriage would be different than this. I thought parenting would be easier than this. I uh, thought my career would be landing me in a different spot. I thought money would be uh, a little easier to come by than it's come, come to be. We can get discouraged. Joseph is discouraged. What I, what I like about how God does things is that God didn't come to Joseph in his struggle, in his hurt, in his fear, his difficulties, and say... Buddy, we're going to tie this up with a bow and turn you loose on the world right now. He didn't say, hey, chin up. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. You can do this. Uh, that's not how God does it. The good news is he didn't just say it'll be better, but God abides in times of discouragement. And he came to Joseph. He spoke to Joseph. He reached out to Joseph and and Joseph becomes part of this big eternal plan. There's great meaning to be found in our most difficult days when, when Jesus comes to bear on the situation. So this year, consider the light of Christmas through some fresh eyes. And I know a lot of your stories. This has been a tough year for a lot of us and discouraging time. Uh, God does not leave us to our own ends to, tr to, to try to transform a hopeless situation into something beautiful. But he comes to be with us, his presence with us, God with us. I want to share this passage of Scripture today from Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. Paul writes, So, if there is any encouragement in Christ, again, the reason he tells this story of Christ who has come, he wants to encourage any comfort from love, because we need some comforting. Any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you <clears throat> look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. And then he gives us the greatest of examples. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be, to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. There's a lot of therefores in the Bible. This is one of my favorite ones ever. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Hallelujah. I probably will stop right there. This passage from Philippians is probably a part of, a, of an early, because I, I was reading Romans today and found a piece of it there. It's in several pieces of it appear in other places, some of those same phrasings. But this, uh, all together, probably an early Christian hymn, maybe something they sang together to remind themselves, to, to memor, easily memorize some great truths about who Jesus is and what Jesus came to accomplish. Uh, perhaps it was a, like a confession of faith. These things we declare together as we begin this time of worship, and off they would go to declare some important things about Jesus. When you read Philippians, it's always important to remember that uh, as he writes these words, so hope-filled, joy-filled. The words joy and rejoicing are the repetitive theme through the book of Philippians. And he says this while a prisoner. He's doing, he's doing time when he, when he declares this. Life is hard. He's not sure what the future holds exactly. Everything is, if ever there was a time to be discouraged, to be down, to, to, to be pulling back. But no. Because he knows Jesus. And Jesus makes a difference in such times. And he is leaning into that with all his hearts. When we suffer... Christ offers us himself. That's the good news. He, 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 doesn't, he doesn't offer us platitudes. He doesn't offer us uh, inspirational quotes. He just came himself. And, and 
in dark times, he is our light. So here's the Christmas story from Philippians. The light. God came to earth. So Paul begins talking about Jesus in eternity past. And I want you to remember, Jesus didn't come to be at a manger in Bethlehem in the first century. Fair enough? The person of Jesus as the Son of God was not just a way Jesus was for 30 or so years as a man on this earth. He has always been. The expression of God declared in His Word is that we have eternally Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three in one, but still one, one God in three persons. And uh, this is a part of the mystery and a part of the majesty of the person of God. So, well, that doesn't make sense to me. That's because you're not God. When it makes sense to you, that means you're probably God. Until then, we're going exp- to embrace a mystery that is bigger than we are because God is bigger, greater, more glorious than we are. And he, this is how he has made himself known. Unique, separate persons. And Paul's words in, uh, in this passage... Like John 1, where it says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, Jesus, the fullest, finest, most complete expression of who God is. He's the Word of God. Jesus was with God in eternity past. In his high priestly prayer, John 17, Jesus spoke about the glory he had with the Father before the world was even created. He has always been. When the religious leaders questioned Jesus' authority, he said, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Jesus understood his nature, and Paul declares it, the very nature of God. He did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. Jesus was God. And that word uh, grasp, the same word we get our word harpoon from. And why did Jesus not have to grasp that? A couple of reasons. He didn't have to grasp equality with God because it was already his. You don't need to grasp something that is already firmly in your hand. And Jesus refused to hold on to equality with God. He willingly gave up the glory of heaven to come to this broken world and our broken lives. And he did it for our sake. Uh, I, I talk to people from time to time who say, I just can't. What is God like? How can I really know what God is like? How would I know what God wants me to do? How would I know how God would do things or what God would say or or what his priority list would would look like? How do I know that kind of thing? Well, a vague being in the sky uh, can be far away, but Jesus is God. And Jesus is God in a human body. And we can see him and we can understand him. Uh, Jesus said, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. If you've seen me, you've seen God. You know what God would say and what God would make important and how God would do things because we have seen Jesus. And because Jesus really is God and because he came to this earth, this, this invasion story of Christmas is the most relevant thing to our lives we could imagine to our day today. The light, God became man. This word uh, incarnation, uh, where God becomes flesh and lives among us, the word became flesh, John wrote, and dwelt among us. This wasn't something forced on Jesus. We, We learn here that he made himself nothing, emptied himself. Jesus saw these people need a Savior, and he came to be that Savior. The reality of Christmas, Jesus became a real man. His flesh and his blood and and their bones and there's hair. And he's a real person. He's not a myth. He's not a fable. He's not Jesus the friendly ghost. He is a real person walking on this earth. The Bible says he gave up his divine privileges. This is a New Living Translation of verse 7 of Philippians 2. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form. Now why would Jesus come as a human being? Well, one of my favorite ways to think about that is if he wanted to communicate with dogs, I suppose he would have become a dog. And if he wanted to communicate with birds, he would have become a bird. But he needed to communicate with people and he became a person. 
Why is the incarnation, Jesus remaining fully God, fully man, so important? Hebrews 4.15 tells us this high priest of ours understands our weakness. He faced all the same temptings we do, yet he did not sin. He identifies with us so that he could free us from sin and help us to overcome our sin. How is Jesus like us? Well, he was born like us. Jesus came into this world miraculously, born of a virgin, but born like billions of babies have been born over the course of human history. Fragile infant with the whole history of the world resting in him. There was no flashy entrance, not seen by everyone, not going to said the kids early, not going to the, the highest of the high, the powerful of the world. Came in great humility to a small village, uh, not a prominent place and not to prominent people, to a simple little couple and to uh, some humble shepherds, Jesus Human form, born like us. He grew like us. He grew and developed. And you think about that. I guess Jesus had growth spurts. It's a time when his voice changed. Uh, I've often wondered what it was like to be in school with Jesus. What it was like to be a brother. Having Jesus as a brother. It's hard to imagine that Mary at some point would have slipped up and said, I don't know why you don't. Jesus always puts his clothes away. (laughs) Jesus' room is always clean. Jesus takes out the garbage on his day. And to be in school with Jesus, you know, not out of meanness because there was no sin and always love in Jesus, but, you know, was he the guy in class that always said, "Uh, you forgot to give us our homework for the weekend. Uh, But again, not with a big flash, not with doing uh, tricks for the kids uh, at school wasn't like, well, it's meat surprise day in the school cafeteria, and Jesus just said, oh, I think it's pizza day today. And No, they didn't see him as God. He grew up as they grew up. He lived as they lived, and he gave up his divine privileges. Now, uh, He was tempted like us. The Bible says Jesus was uh, one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Jesus experienced the same pressures that you and I do. He experienced the same temptations that you and I do. He never gave in to them. That's what made him different is he just didn't sin. But he was exposed to all the same things in all the same ways that we are. This is important because Jesus cares about you when you're struggling with temptation. He relates to you, he understands you, and he wants to give you strength to overcome because that's his nature, and he has walked those paths. He knows. He suffered like us. He felt pain. He felt disappointment. He was tired. He grieved. He cried. He was human. In Gethsemane, Jesus said, My soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. He knew what it was like to experience pain, to be under pressure, He became who we are so that we could become his. That's the light of Christmas in our dark places. Jesus, the light, came to die. Jesus did not stay in a manger. I wouldn't give you a plug nickel for uh, uh, for a Jesus that stops at the Christmas story. We talked about it before. I wouldn't, I wouldn't give you anything for a cross. You see, the cross back behind me, it still had a Jesus hanging on it. My Jesus is alive and well today, uh, not, not, not still nailed to a cross. Well, I'm not going to stop at the Christmas story because that's not where Jesus stopped his story. He went to the cross and voluntarily, voluntarily laid down his life. Uh, verse 8, being found in, in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Nobody put him there. Nobody forced it on him. He volunteered for this. He gave himself up for us at the cross. Two big reasons. First, to demonstrate God's love. The Bible says God shows his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 
How does he show his love? Oh, man, some of you going through tough times. Well, does God love me? Has he forgotten me? Has he left me by the wayside? Has he abandoned me? Where is God's love? I'm not feeling it. I'm not seeing it. And sometimes I experience those frustrations when things aren't going the way I've charted my course to go. It's not, it's not playing out the way I have always imagined it. But I'm learning as I get older that if God never does another thing for me besides what Jesus did at the cross, he's done everything he needs to to prove to me forevermore he loves me. He loves you. Jesus said, greater love has no man than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Jesus gave his life for us. And that's true when, when we were, before we were born, when we were still rejecting him, when we did nothing to reach out to him, he, by a great expression of grace, was reaching out to us. He came to die to pay for our sins. When, when you break a law... You have to pay the penalty. I was uh, uh, driving up 35 yesterday. There were a good many people going to have to pay some penalties. Some folks had felt a great freedom, apparently, on the great highway of uh, 35 coming up from uh, Austin area to, uh, to uh, drive unlimited speeds. Thought they were in the Autobahn. They're paying penalties. You break man's laws, you pay man's penalty. You break God's laws, you pay God's penalty. You know what God's penalty is for sin? The Bible says the wages of sin is death. That means our bodies are going to get old and wear out. There's a curse that comes upon us because of our sin. But it also means, apart from Jesus Christ, we're going to be separated from God forever in hell if we do not have a relationship to Him. We haven't experienced that grace and that love and surrendered our lives to Him. So there's a, that death. And I'm so glad that that is not the end of 623 of Romans. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Well, there's some good news in God's Word. The Bible says, He Himself bore our sins on his bo- in His body on the tree, uh, in a poetic way of referring to the cross, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By His wounds, you have been healed. What Jesus did over 2,000 years ago at the cross through the resurrection makes a difference in my life and can make a difference in your life today. Today. No matter how hard it is, how dark it is, how broken it feels, He can do that today. You can be completely forgiven of everything you've ever done wrong, ever will do wrong. That is the light that this Christmas story shines into our world. The angel said, there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. A Savior. Jesus came to be the Savior of the world. And if you didn't need a Savior, God would have done something else. But he knew that that was the only way this was going to get better. And Jesus came to this broken world and lived among us in this broken world. And left the glory of heaven to do it. The fact that Jesus came. uh, He is a human being. Born as a baby. Grew as a man. Knew the pressures, the strains of life on this world and the things that relationships do to us in uh, sometimes blessing, sometimes difficulty in this world. Died on the cross to pay for our sins. Raised from the dead. He did that because that was the only way it was going to get done. Jesus came to be a Savior because we needed saving. Salvation through Jesus Christ means freedom. Means freedom from guilt. Freedom from fear. Freedom from worry. Freedom from discouragement. Freedom from the purposelessness of life. Free to live the way God shaped you, created you, desires for you to to live. And the story doesn't even end here. As wonderful as relationship to Christ is here, there's a heaven waiting for believers out there. And this story takes us all the way to there. He came on a mission to bring you home to the Father. That as he has returned to his glory in heaven, he's coming again on the clouds of glory for his church to take us to be with him. That's the light Christmas brings. And in this light, Jesus is Lord. The Bible says because Jesus was willing to walk this this road of humility as a human being, flesh and blood on this earth, 
Therefore, God has highly exalted him, bestowed on him the name that is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Wow. That's, uh, that's worth memorizing. He was born, and the angels proclaimed him Lord. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the... That's pretty good for on-the-fly audience participation. Christ the Lord. I need you to be together a second time. What does it mean to be a Christian? To be a believer? To be saved? Jesus Christ is Lord. That's what it means. It means I've surrendered my life to Him. I acknowledge the fact He is God and I am not. I put all my faith in Him that what He did at the cross paid everything it needed to be paid, my debt to sin. He demonstrated the power of who He was and what He did at the cross by being raised from the dead. He is Lord. And he has everything under control. He is the king over everything. And when I surrender my life to him, it means he's going to be the king over me too. What does it mean to say Jesus is Lord? I acknowledge that Jesus really is God. More than a man, more than a prophet, more than a fine moral example. He's a whole lot more than that. He is king of kings, Lord of lords. And what that means is I will do whatever he wants me to do. The test of a commitment to Christ is obedience. You do what he said to do. He's the Lord of my life. I don't do anything he tells me to do. I live my life by my own rules the way I want to live them. That's not the same thing as Lord. You're talking about a different Jesus now. We do what he said to do. He is Lord. I believe Jesus has everything under control. That's what it means that Jesus is Lord. Even when my life feels dark and a whole lot of things seem like they're flapping in the breeze and feel out of control. To say Jesus is Lord is a statement for me too of comfort and encouragement. And I need some comfort and encouragement sometimes. Even if everything looks bleak, Jesus is Lord. And I've got, and I know he's got, when I'm out of control, he's got everything under control. And I may not see the pattern of tracing where he's, where he's doing things, how he's doing things. I, I don't understand a lot of things about his timing in this world. But Jesus is Lord. And I recognize the truth because he's Lord. He has everything under control. I don't have to know. As long as I'm trusting, he knows. Nothing escapes his care and concern because Jesus is Lord. And Jesus is Lord is to say, okay, so 2019, let's see. I don't know, the, the economy... Our crazy Congress, uh, war, terrorism, relationship struggles everywhere. I don't know what 2019 holds. But I'm not too worried about 2019 because I know Jesus is Lord in 2019 as well. So to, uh, to say Jesus is Lord means I've committed my whole life to Jesus. Not just the Sunday part. Not just the religious touchstone here and there part, but my whole life to Jesus. And he has a right to determine what's right in my life. He has a right to say, this is where we're going tomorrow. This is where we're going today. This is what I want to do in you. The dynamic of walking in a relationship to Almighty God. The Bible says here, one day... Every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord. Everybody. And God, life is preparation for eternity. And so God gives us this life to make the choice. Jesus is Lord. And I want to encourage you. You just don't want to walk out of here saying, maybe he is, maybe he isn't. Because everybody's going to acknowledge it one day. But some people, they're going to be separated from God forever because they didn't do it in this life, but they're still going to, at that point, the most devout atheist, the most critical skeptic, will one day bow his knee before Almighty Jesus and say, Jesus is Lord. Why not today? Why not today? Not just for what it does today, but for what it's going to do to paint the picture of eternity for you. What's the result of this light of Christmas? Jesus is Lord. That, that phrase, Jesus is Lord, we find it through Christian history as a, an important declaration. It's not just a sidebar. It's not just a, one of those religious things religious people say. 
but it's a test uh, of what's true in your life, what you really believe and who you really are and the one you're, you're truly devoted to. Jesus is the Lord. People have given their lives and continue around our world to lay down their lives because Jesus is Lord and they're not afraid to declare it. Jesus is Lord. And I think we need to do a little rediscovering of it. It's what it means to be a believer. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead. You shall be saved. Jesus is Lord. Some of you today, the way it feels, you think, well, evil seems to be winning. But I'm telling you, Jesus is Lord. Some of you, you're not sure how you're going to get through today, much less make it into tomorrow. But here's the great hope that is ours in Christ. Jesus is Lord. There are no problems too big for evil. Plenty of plenty of things too big for me to handle, some things too big for you to handle, but not too big for God to handle because even in this life right now, still living in a broken world, when you trust in Him, Jesus is still Lord over those things. When you're discouraged, Jesus is Lord. When you are lonely, Jesus is Lord. When you are depressed, Jesus is Lord. When you're afraid, Jesus is Lord. When you are captured by grief and loss. Jesus is Lord. And when you don't feel like you can take another step, much less go another mile, Jesus is Lord. And uh, I, just, I started making it my habit some months ago that when I face something, when I feel something, when, when it gets hard, repetition of that phrase has been quite liberating for me. I'll get, invite you to say it with me. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen.